<clears throat> Melissa, are you are ready and Sander? Yes, we're ready. I think you are next, huh? Isn't it? Yes, we're next. Okay, so go ahead, take the screen and in, uh, introduce yourself. Yes. Oh, just trying to find the right screen. <laughs> There we are. All right, um, it's nice to be able to be here today. Um, we will be presenting the work, um, on the project and um, paper that we've been working on together with Sander Siepel and like Gwen Yan as well. Um, the title of our work is the interplay between craving and impulse control and adaptive network model for drug, drug addiction treatment. So. We're going about addiction again, but in a slightly different way this time. So we'll just quickly walk you through the structure of this presentation. We'll start off with the background of addiction a bit, then just briefly look into the like the modeling approach that we used, which is also <laughs> by adaptive temporal causal networks, then go over to the model that we kind of build in the framework of, of this um, concept based on addiction and treatment. Then we will go over to the validation of the model and simulations that we run, uh, just to finish off with some concluding remarks and take away. So first a bit about the background of addiction. So addiction, which is like a chronic relapsing disorder that is characterized by compulsive drug seeking and intense cravings, is a disorder that is caused and maintained by a complex interplay of many, many factors. Just we listed just some of them over here. But the important thing to note here is that addiction is not only caused or facilitated by many different factors, but also by the interplay between these factors, creating a really complex picture about how an individual can come to start consuming drugs and later on then become addictive, addicted to a certain substance. Um, and what is also important to note is that much research has been focused on how to treat addiction. Um, and many treatments have also been proposed and are currently being used as well. Nevertheless, despite these efforts, a treatment that we could consider as highly effective in treating addiction has not really yet been found. Um, and relapse rates remain very, very high. So therefore we kind of recognize this, this complex picture in which addiction develops and is maintained and also the need to further understand it to be able to effectively be able to treat this, uh, this disorder. And therefore the goal that we proposed ourselves for this, uh, for this project and for this study was to introduce an adaptive temporal causal network model that would allow to computationally simulate drug addiction and its treatment. So we use the similar framework um, that has already been mentioned, which is where we'll just walk through very, very quickly. Um, but we model based on adaptive temporal causal networks um, here's a very simple just representation of such a model, but basically we have states which are represented by nodes. These states have connections that can have different weights depending on how strongly one factor influences the, one state influences the other state. Speed, speed factors indicate for every for every state how much that state changes in response to the um, incoming connections. And then a combination factor for every state also indicates how the single individual um, incoming connections impact that state together, then creating an aggregated impact for that state. So then these states have, um, have different values between zero and one that change through time, depending on the incoming connections and their initial values. Now, the, the simplified model that we see here is just a temporal causal network. But often the characteristics that such a model has also change throughout the time course of, for example, simulation or the development of the of time. Um, and that would mean that a model it's by itself can also be adaptive. Now, how do we incorporate this? We incorporate this by, we can't see this here in this like, simplification, but we incorporate this by adding self model verification states that then represent these characteristics and how they can change as well. So what did that look like for our model and now in the case of drug addiction and its treatment? So what you can see here at the very right is the drug consumption that an individual would have. And the rationale that we had 
while building this model was closely linked to the definition of drug addiction that we had, which was mainly um, based on the idea, like I said already, but it's mainly that drug consumption, uh, drug addiction is characterized by in intense um, drug craving and the inability to control those impulses. So then we reason that whenever the ability to control an impulse is higher than the strength of the craving that a person has, um, a person will be able to withstand the impulse of consuming drugs and will not consume. If it is the other way around, craving is stronger than the impulse that I want, than the ability that one has to control one's impulses, a person will give in and will consume drugs. So that is why we have these other states here that are fundamental um, in determining whether the person will finally and will, will in the end be consuming drugs or not. Now, these states for itself, we know <laughs> that the, the, the picture of why someone would consume drugs and, or eventually become addicted as well is much more complex than that, which is why we have all these other states that have been frequently found in the literature and where there's like really a like, uh, considerable body of research on that then interact with impulse control and craving strength. Um, it would probably be a bit too much to go through each of them and how they're connected and why, but it has, for example, been found very frequent, frequently that the more exposure to drugs or like the exposure to environmental cues that remind a person of the drugs, which we can see here at the bottom, um, really impact how much a person craves the drugs. On the other hand, um, a person's uh, social support and network really has a strong influence on a person's emotional well-being. And we know that whenever we are more stressed or more anxious, the person is also more likely to not be able to control their impulses as well and could then, in the case of drug consumption, give in and consume. Um, now, with these three steps, so drug consumption, post control, craving strength, and then these other factors that in turn impact this, we had then built a picture of how a person or why a person would consume drugs. But, and then we needed in some way to build in treatment. And the way we learned about this is, we know that different treatments try to very specifically target specific um, aspects or factors that we are, know that are associated with drug consumption. So what we did here is then we had a state that represent the treatment. Yep, that was the wrong direction. That represent the treatment. And, that then had outgoing connections to several of these factors that we know that are often impacted or targeted by treatment and gave those uh, outgoing connections different connection points. For example, we know that contingency management, management is all about increasing an individual's uh, motivation to abstain from drug consumption because it, it, it consists in uh, giving a person vouchers whenever they abstain from consuming that they can then exchange for other goods. Uh, cognitive behavioral therapy, would then be impacting coping mechanisms because they work on those and also on the belie beliefs that the person has about drugs. And for example, inpatient hospi uh, like a hospitalization really tries to tackle the issue of environmental cues and exposure to drugs and therefore reducing craving strength. So what was important about this model is that we wanted to make it as flexible as possible to be able to represent as many different realities and treatments as possible. And that was there. With this model, we made this possible by being able to give all these different and um, outgoing connections from treatment to these other factors, different weights. So if we were looking at a treatment that was really focusing on coping mechanisms and for example, environmental cues and exposure to drugs, we could give all of these outgoing connections, I have a high value, let's say 0.9 or 0.8, whereas these would then put relatively low. But in addition to being able to model different treatments, we also know that addiction patterns vary across addictions, to, like addictions to different substances and as well individuals. For one person, cultural norms could be very important in determining a person's drug consumption, but for the other one, it's really the biological vulnerability that plays a key role. And therefore we thought that this model could also really be very unique and, and, and useful in providing insight or being able to model individual cases or cases of specific like drug consumption patterns because it would allow to really give like different values to all of these different factors, depending on the context that I want to look at or study or understand further. So then, yeah, so this model is just like, it's just a causal temporal network model with no adapt adaptivity in it. But we know that when it comes to drug consumption and addiction and especially its treatment, 
um, learning plays a very fundamental role. So we really wanted to bring that in as well into our model. And we did that by making connection weights as well as thresholds adaptive. By making connection weights adaptive, adaptive, we also followed the principle of heavy learning that has been mentioned a couple of times, which really builds on the fact that the more often I use a connection, the stronger it becomes. And also the other way around. If I don't lose a connection, it becomes weaker. Um, so here we have several connections that can become stronger over time, but also thresholds. We argued that the more often a state would become active, um, like for example, motivation, the stronger it would become afterwards to activate that state as well. Um, so yeah, it might be a bit too much to go into each of those and why each of them is connected. But with that, we really built our model um, that enabled le learning as well as flexibility. And then we wanted to validate our model and see how it would behave if we were trying to run uh, different uh, scenarios or simulations. And what we did, so we, we wanted to compare it to what we know from the literature. Um, the issue with addiction and its treatment is that there is really not too much consistent and specific quantitative data that we could compare it to. However, what is known is that in general, there's like strong consistency, consistency instead of showing that longer treatments are more effective and also more comprehensive treatments are more effective. So that is what we modeled then, and we wanted to, wanted to see whether that would happen in our model as well. So then we, when in the paper, we included four, four uh, example scenarios. When two of them, we have a comprehensive treatment where all the different states here have a, have a like, treatment has a connection, uh, yeah, has a connection to all different states, whether then we have a less comprehensive treatment where uh, drug beliefs and motivation, so these two, we just chose them randomly. Um, or were not active. Um, and then we also varied the length of the treatment to see also again how our model would behave in that scenario. So here we'll go into the first into the first scenario that we run, a concept from comprehensive treatment. So all outgoing connections are active of long duration. Um, I hope this is visible or it's not too small. But basically what I want you to first focus, so here we have uh, the different models, uh, so the different states and the values that they have across uh, time units. Um, and what we have here is, uh, I first want you to focus on the blue line that you can't really see at the beginning, but it goes down here and then it goes up, goes up here and then down again. Basically this is our treatment. It's our treatment that starts at time point 100, then goes on for a hundred more like time units before stopping again. Um, and this is the value that all our states have before treatment starts. Now, what is interesting to note is that as soon as our treatment started, here in purple, we have craving strength, which if you remember is one of the two, two states that was just before drug consumption. So it was really about the interplay between craving strength and impulse control starts to go down as soon as our treatment starts. And then also our, drug, uh, our impulse control goes starts to first slowly, but then more and more gradually go up. And as soon as these two meet, we see that drug consumption, which is the red line over here, reaches zero. Um, so then in this case, we would see that this first treatment, treatment of 100 time points was effective, like a comprehensive treatment of 100 times was effective in reducing drug consumption. And, and yeah, in this case, it would then refer to addiction. What is also interesting is that after treatment stops, we do not see that drug consumption go, goes up again. That means that learning has to has occurred during the treatment that was sufficient for the person to then maintain the abstinence and avoiding relapse, which is one of the main issues of drug addiction as well. And that is really like, uh, we can really see why or how that happened here because we see strong learning. These are the, the, the values of the adaptive states. And we see that for many, many states that are related to craving strength, um, there is a certain sort of there's a sort of extinction happening because their values are going down, and for a lot of states that are related to drug uh, impulse control, we see that a lot of um, yeah these the connections become stronger. So then we looked at the same thing um, to see whether that comprehensive treatment would just be as effective as it was shorter, and we did see that the first treatment did lower drug consumption a bit, but it wasn't sufficient. So would, that would also again represent what we see in reality that shorter treatments are not as effective as long ones. It goes up again and then only after the second treatment, a person is able to reduce their drug consumption and then have learned enough to also remain abstinent over the long term, longer time. 
I think I will skip this first scenario because it's again similar stuff. But um, for the last one, we have again, we have the less comprehensive treatment. So two of the states are not, uh, are not have no connection to the treatment. And we see that drug consumption does go down at the beginning, not as much as with the previous one, which was more comprehensive. Um, but then it goes up again. It does go down after the second treatment, again, not as much as with the more comprehensive treatment, but then we see a bit of relapse. Nevertheless, enough learning occurred during the treatment, as we can see through like movement of these curves as well. Um, but the person did learn enough to self-regulate themselves afterwards. They do need a bit more time, but then finally still like achieve absence. So overall, we do see these patterns that we would observe in real life as well in our model, that longer treatments are more effective and also more comprehensive treatments. So that really try to address several aspects that could feed one's addiction um, to kind of, yeah, tackle it. So yeah, we need, to, <laughs> we need to tackle several aspects to then be able to successfully actually address that addiction. So yeah, I will just conclude with some final remarks and takeaway. So again, we think it's important to know that there was like, there, when it comes to addiction research is really not much precise, quantitative, and especially consistent data, which made it difficult to really compare on a very precise level, how, how did our different states would behave um, in this model. We could not say, for example, that, or there was no consistent data that would say that motivation is this strongly linked or the effect sizes are this strong to, learn when it, to impose control. Uh, which would have really helped to kind of construct a more precise data like model. But at the same time, um, modeling is, uh, when it comes to modeling, one really has to be careful to not, to not leave out the like how individual or like how different also each case is. This is not only when it comes to different addictions, but also to individuals, um, which then kind of really could also explain why we do not have this consistent data because addiction varies so much and it's so individual across cases um, that we also want the model to be open to, to be able to model many of these different like scenarios and individual cases as well. And something else to keep in mind is always when we work with models that models are simpl simplifications of super complex real world processes that can never fully capture what is going on in the actual world. But at the same time, we also believe that modeling is about that in a certain way. It's about simplifying a complex process to the degree that we can process it better, can understand it better, can look at it and come up with new ideas. And in that sense, we, we believe that we were successful in providing a model for addiction treatment that, that, that is valuable because it incorporates multiple, multiple factors. It's re it really builds on adaptivity, so on, on the key role that learning plays in treating addiction. And it is also flexible that can be adapted to different types of treatments, to different types of addictions and even individual cases. So yeah, with that having been said, I, I come back to where we started off um, and, and we hope to have provided more insight with this presentation to the, the model that we introduced in our paper, uh, which put, like is an adaptive network model for drug addiction treatment. And if there's any questions, we will of course be very happy to answer them. Thank you. So this was the last talk, talk, Jan, from your group. I cannot hear you, sorry. So, maybe next year? Ah, <laughs> yes, very impressive. Um, why do you select so diverse topics? And what is the unifying idea in all of them? Uh, there is no unifying idea for the topics because every student or student group has their own preference and I follow that. Hmm. So that brings me everywhere and it's very interesting. Yeah, but uh, does your technology allow to control treatment for drugs? Or? Well, in principle, the, 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 in this one and the previous presentation show about that. But of course, you always want to have a, a deeper level of detail in that. So that would be, uh, would need more refinement probably. Oh, yeah. So you, uh, you believe uh, that uh, there is a ground truth? Uh, I had one question, but I'll just wait for please, you. Please, please, please go ahead. My question is, uh, uh, obviously, the speaker said models are simplifications, but uh 
their instructive simplifications because hopefully they're hopefully they're accurate uh, at some boundary condition. Uh, what are the boundary conditions or or, or conditions in which the network adaptive model uh, wades cuts away the complexity and achieves uh, some significant degree of accuracy, would you say? When, are you asking about the specific model? Yes. Yeah, so to which degree, just to see whether I got your question correctly, it was kind of long, but. So, uh, the, uh, let me simplify it. Uh, as you mentioned, drug addiction is really complicated. Uh, your model is a simplification of how people respond to drug addiction. It may be right, it may be wrong. My question is, is uh, are there some specific conditions under which you expect this to be right? And I ask that because uh, I'm trying to figure out with this network adaptive approach in general, uh, what it's particularly useful, what it's particularly good at. So, I mean, this adaptive network model, I think it's particularly good at modeling processes that change over time. Um, that have causal relationships. It's, so it's really like certain phenomena that fulfill certain certain conditions that are then weighted in by heavily by this model, like this, this kind of type of modeling. Um, then the question is then like whether we believe that addiction uh, is related to that. And I would say, yes, the addiction is a changing changing phenomena that changes in every individual throughout time, especially if you try to treat it, you, you try to observe changes. And I think that would be then part of the value that this type of modeling brings in. But um, yeah, I feel like I'm not fully answering your question though. Uh, maybe I can add something. The, the intuition behind the network connections is mainly based on the idea of a causal relation. And causality plays a very big role in many disciplines because that's all, in, in many cases almost the only thing how people express knowledge about uh, relationships. So one thing causes another thing. And the only thing what is a bit more special here is that the causal relation has its dynamics, which is uh, specified in a precise manner so that you know when it's fast or slow. And in addition, it's even adaptive. So if you add those things, then you go much further than what the traditional idea of causal modeling in AI is, because that's usually uh, like more qualitative or static. And if you have these dynamics, and then on top of that, even adaptation and even of more levels, then you can do many things. And then you can relate um, uh, easily to literature like uh, about plasticity and metaplasticity in uh, neuroscience, for example. So that, that are a, a number of features, I think. Okay, cool. Thank you very much. And, uh, to, to, just, uh, just to leave you with a question, maybe we could talk uh, at another time. Yeah. Uh, uh, how, uh, I'm wondering how it's possible to know when you're creating this causal model, whether you have the right causes. We had, we, we, that's the, the issue, we, uh, we do that uh, as kind of delegation to people that know about the real uh, empirical side. We are not specialists in empirical science as modelers, but we find the literature where we, that we make an assumption about literature, well, let's assume that this literature is okay. And then that's our basis. So everything we conclude is relative to that literature. I, I think that that was what Sam basically mentioned uh, many hours ago. Uh, how do you test the model? Uh, how do you adapt the model or let, let the model adapt itself? But, but th that wasn't a question, that was just a rhetorical statement. So I'll let the next person go on. So that leaves us without questions further? <laughs> no more questions, yes. Okay. Um, maybe I shall continue then. Let me try to rephrase uh, this question. What your model is good for 
uh, I understand one possible use is some kind of explanation of the nature of the phenomenon. But what else uh, can you, you... You said you possibly could uh, use it for drug treatment or for controlling other processes in other domains. But uh, can you be a little more specific? Like, what is the potential use of your model? Uh, or maybe you did use it for some practical reason. Or I don't know. Yeah, so <clears throat> this, mo uh, this approach has been developed over many years. And in, in, in these years, uh, different people have addressed different subdomains and domains. And yeah, this causality is such a universal phenomenon that, that there, there was no uh, selectivity in where it fits and where it does not fit. So that's, uh, it, it is was not developed for one specific domain and it, uh, it has been applied in different domains. Uh -huh. So um, the task is just to reproduce the phenomenon in computer, correct? Yeah, a phenomenon where we assume that there is some scientific knowledge available. I see. And this is the main goal, to obtain some general scientific knowledge. Yeah, yeah. Are there possible yeah. practical applications? Sorry. Yeah, I would say maybe beyond reproducing, maybe reproducing some sort of, uh, of general idea is the first step. But then you also wanted to, it helps you to explore further scenarios as well. Right. Uh -huh. so now we build a model for a specific and we build a model for addiction and want to see about treatment and let's say the real world uh, treatments that we have out there like are mainly based on on motivation some that just focus on like um abstinence so like the environment oh. drug exposure and then others just uh, focus on like um on cognitive like parts and now we want to develop a new type of addiction that we haven't actually implemented yet in real life but we would know it would implement four of the factors that un up until now, just two of the treatments had like individually separated. So, so then it allows you to first, like on a theoretical level, explore new scenarios that we haven't yet explored in real life. We just know that this model works in the scenarios that we have tested and where we would have the empirical data and maybe some support for causality. So we know it works there and we can now on a theoretical level explore that it would how it would look like in a different scenario. Now we don't know whether then it actually in real world would also apply then. We would then have to take the next step again and go out like to the practical side. So I think it can really help like to take to take real world things, make it a bit more abstract, then we can work with it, think about a process, and then go again back to the real world and see whether our applications and statements still hold. But maybe with a bit more of support, still never full support, but a bit more than we would have without. So I see you can possibly make predictions. You can test various uh, treatment scenarios or maybe different drugs uh, test in the computer before you use them in, in experiments on humans, let's say. I, uh, I wouldn't maybe really say testing, but exploring how it could look like. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Yeah. And did you try any of these? I mean, uh, like prediction, for example, the well, you say you, you are disconnected from the people who deal with this problem. In... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, that's good for you. Unfortunately, not clinicians, so we don't have our own patients <laughs> whom we could test. <laughs> but why not? Why, why not establish connection with clinicians? Yeah, it would be possible. It uh -huh. would be possible. Okay, yeah. uh, thank you. Maybe uh, can somebody else continue this questioning? I see a lot of people on the list and they all are silent. Actually, I, I wanted to add one last thing to uh, to that question, Jan. Uh, when it comes to the impacts of technology like, like, uh, like AI, or sorry, artificial general intelligence, people, people's opinions vary wildly. Uh, it, it's almost impossible. It seems almost impossible to predict the future. However, I found that there are certain boundary or certain assumptions that make it, I believe, reliably possible to, to predict the future. So for example, in the case of artificial general intelligence, uh, 
uh, it acts like a system of optimization that's owned by some individual. So as someone earlier on in this workshop mentioned, if you have uh, an exponentially better system at, uh, at achieving your own goals, you are going to achieve vastly greater levels of inequality uh, in your favor than otherwise. Would you agree? Yeah, maybe. So, so the point is, that's just an example. The, the other option is a, is a collective intelligence that optimizes uh, collective outcomes. So just by looking at that one factor, whether you're optimizing for an individual or whether you're optimizing for the group, you can uh, sort, you can determine more precisely what the impact of this technology will be. So what I was trying to get to get at with, with your simulation was, are there some, and this isn't something that you have to answer right now, but, but maybe I'll, I'll I'll talk to you at another time to uh, to get your response once you've thought about it. But are there some uh, cases, some simplifying assumptions, some boundary conditions under which uh, the, the the causes you've chosen or the causes you've assumed uh, are almost certainly correct? Yeah, these are interesting questions. Earlier today, I already sent you an email to propose a Zoom meeting. Huh? So maybe we can discuss that in that Zoom meeting. Amazing. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Anybody else, please? Comment? Uh. Well, I take this take this silence as approval of your work and thank you very much uh, so now i believe we have uh, we are done with your group correct and we, we have um, 